Hello and welcome to this presentation on the past, the present and the future of HACCP. My name is Paul Bisseling, I'm a food safety consultant and in the past 25 years I've been studying and practicing um, HACCP basically each every single day. Um, I do this work for Precom in the Netherlands. Um, the presentation that you are going to see is in, uh, will be in three parts. The last part, the general principles of food hygiene, will be sort of the future of HACCP. The present state of HACCP I will discuss in this part on FSSC and ISO 22000. And the first part, the food safety bow tie, is very much about the future of HACCP, but I will also include a story from the past. So we'll start with that part of the presentation. So thanks again for joining in and uh, I'd like to share some of the lessons that I've learned throughout the years. So. You're welcome. In applying HACCP, I learned an awful lot uh, from the food, what we call the food safety bow tie. And the food safety bow tie is a um, general uh, approach for risk management. This is the bow tie approach. Uh, the center of this model is a problem. And this problem has consequences. And these consequences can be very serious or less serious or somewhere in between. On the left side of the model, we'll find the causes. And there can be different causes to the same kind of problem. This is the basic understanding of risk management. When we apply this model to food safety, then it will look like this. In the center we have unsafe food. Uh, consequences can be that people end up in hospital, or maybe even fatalities. People might need medical treatment in the center, or in less serious uh, occasions, people there might be unrest or there might be discomfort. So these are the consequences. When we look at the causes of unsafe food, then one of the major causes is contamination. Um, contamination with bacteria or chemical substance, uh, substances. Um, when it comes to contamination with bacteria, then a small contamination will usually not be a direct cause for unsafe food. But if, for example, that one salmonella bacteria is going to grow, will develop into one million salmonella bacteria, then we'll have unsafe food. So there is a combination of two causes, contamination and development. Um, Another possible cause is natural presence. And then of course we talk about allergens, or maybe like fish bones, or some toxins that, could, that can be of natural presence in some products. So then the, co the, the cause will be in this route. Um, and there's also this possibility that we have natural presence of some substances and that they start to develop into what we call a hazard, into unsafe food. An example of this would be acrylamide. Acrylamide is produced under high temperatures, 120 degrees centigrade, uh, out of substances that are naturally present. So this is the, the primary problem in food safety. And from this point on we can start building our food safety bow ties. Um, I will apply this food safety bow tie to an example from the past. This, as you can tell, is Dutch. And it's somewhere from the 1940s. And some, uh, somewhere in the 1940s, they started promoting pasteurized milk. Before the 1940s, people would drink raw milk. And maybe you can understand that raw milk is causing safety problems. So let's apply to the, the food safety bow tie to this uh, situation. Um, so here is our problem. There's salmonella present in milk, in 25 grams of milk. And when we look at the co consequences, um, people might get sick due to the salmonella, but might not go to a general practitioner. And that would be, out of 10,000 cases, that would be the case in about 8,000, with 8,000 people. Out of these 10,000, about 1,500 people would go to a general practitioner, because they're suffering some severe consequences. But even more severe would be for the 300 people that end up in hospital. 10 people might end up with a fatality. So out of 10,000 people, this would be the consequences. So that's a major part of the understanding. Another major part of the understanding is, of course, the causes. Um, basically, salmonella bacteria will be present in the feces of a cow. And from the feces, uh, might end up on the other, and from the other of the cow, it might end up in the milk. So there we have one cause, a contamination. Contamination might also happen due to the farmer, because of his personal hygiene, it's not too good, and then he might contaminate the milk. Another source or another route for this uh, contamination might be through the equipment. 
So we have already three causes and another cause might be an unhealthy cow. Might be some inflammations or something like that. These would all be causes to, uh, to the unsafe product. Um, when we look at this in a risk matrix, basically the risk matrix is integrated in this model, but to show you how it looks like in a, in a risk model. In the 1930s we would, be, we would be in this position. Salmonella causes very serious health problems and the likelihood of these health problems to occur would be high. So basically in the 1940s we would be in a forbidden area. We would be in the red area and we want to get out of that. In the 1940s we found a solution. We found a solution in pasteurization. And basically the pasteurization was mandated in law. Every, every producer of fresh milk had to pasteurize the milk. And the idea of that law and the idea of the pasteurization, there it is, 72 degrees for 15 seconds, the idea would be that there would be no more fatalities, no more hospitalizations, no more general practitioners. We would all go down to zero. And if you look at that in a risk matrix, then we would move from 1930s, 1930s to the 1940s. This was the idea. Um, but the real life turned out to be different. In the 1950s we found out that although we wanted this situation, the actual situation like this, we didn't have 8,000 people sick, but we had 800. We would not have 1,500 people at a general practitioner, but 150. 30 people in hospital and still one fatality. That was not what we were aiming for. We were aiming for zeros. So, basically we found ourselves not over here, but over there. Question is, how come? And the first suggestions would be that the capability of this pasteurization wasn't good enough. 72 degrees is not enough, 15 seconds is not enough, it has to be longer or higher temperatures. With this suggestion we turned to the scientists that, that did uh, research on this pasteurization and they stated that that's not going to help you. Because the capability of this 72 degrees uh, centigrade in 15 seconds is already 100%. Um, you can do 15 seconds more, but it's, uh, it's not going to help you. This is not a problem, is what they stated. It's not a capability problem. If it's not a capability problem, we found out it was a reliability problem. In practice of this pasteurization, there would be low temperatures. We would not get to that 72 degrees centigrade. We would be stuck at 50 or something like that, due to problems with heat supply. Steam, steam supply and that kind of problems. And it happened quite a lot. And that's the explanation. There was only a reliability of 90%. So instead of having 10,000 casualties, we would have 1,000. So in the 1950s we found out that actually this was a reliability problem. So in addition to the laws on pasteurization that we introduced in the 1940s, we had an, uh, another law saying that if you want to do pasteurization for fresh drink milk, you have to have a thermograph. You have to have a monitoring system on that low temperatures. And that thermograph has to be uh, linked to a flow divert. That whenever the temperature was low, the milk would not be sent to ready for consumption, but would be returned to the raw milk to be pasteurized again. So that was a law in the 50s, and actually what the thermograph did was it brought our reliability from 90 to 100 percent, and all the casualties over there in the consequences will be gone. So then we finally back to zero where we want. Um, and in the risk matrix, it, it will look like this. Uh, one kind of detail, it's not, we're still in the very low, it's not really zero. When you look at this, this 100%, it's basically it's 99.9999999999. But that's a technical thing for, for the microbiologists among you. Um, so we're in an acceptable level of risk. Um, and this is what the bow tie looks like. Um, one of the strong things in the bow tie approach is that it shows the repetitive uh, nature of this kind of problems. 
Basically what we're looking at, we're looking at a problem with a solution. But apparently this solution comes with new problems. And for the new problems we have new solutions. But with the new solutions again come new problems. So what we've discussed here in pasteurization, we can also discuss here with the thermograph. What's the capability of this thermograph to detect the problem of low temperatures? And what's the reliability of that thermograph? And we know that ter ter thermometer thermometers can deviate. And for that we have a solution and we call that calib calibration. And this is very much what the bow tie is about. The bow tie shows us there are different levels of management. There is a primary level we find over here, there's a secondary level we find over here, there's a tertiary level over there, and there's other levels to add to that. Basically, endless. Interesting thing to see also is that there was no reliability problems with the short time. In the laws that we introduced in the 1950s, we had to monitor the temperature, but there was no reliability problems with short time. And it's basically because the technical build-up of this piece of equipment. Short time was no problem. Short time is no problem, the temperature is. So it's all a reliability thing. So this is what a food safety bow tie looks like. Uh, and it taught me a lot about HACCP. So the question is, how does this relate to HACCP? These are the 10 definitions that you need to understand about HACCP. It took me 25 years to get this, to understand this. Because you have to understand every single word that is over here. And you have to understand the relation between all of these definitions. And here they are in alphabetical order. But the, the first thing you need to learn about these definitions is their, is their logical order. And the logical order we can perfectly uh, place in this food safety bow tie. Because out of these 10 definitions, these five are all related to hazards and control measures. And the first thing you need to understand is what's, my ha what's your hazard? The second thing is what's the acceptable level for that hazard? The third thing is about the control measure. You have to be sure about the capability of that control measure, the capability over here. We do that in validation and through that validation we find a critical limit of 72 degrees uh, centigrade 15 seconds. So these are five of the definitions. Three other definitions are over here. That's the deviation from the critical limit. You need to have monitoring, which is the thermo thermograph, and you have to have a correct, uh, corrective action, which is in the flow divert. So here is eight of the definitions that you need to understand. The number nine is in verification, and uh, calibration can be seen as a part of verification. Verification can be on other places in the, in the, in the model as well, but one important place is over here. So that's number nine. And number ten is the definition of a CCP. And in this case, pasteurization is our CCP. But it can only be a CCP when we can apply monitoring and corrective actions. So, um, so to understand a CCP, you need to understand ten definitions. It's two hands full of definitions that you need to understand. And next to that you need to understand likelihood and severity of hazards and likelihood and severity of deviations. So there's a lot of concepts, a lot of different things that you need to deal with in a, in, in a, in a hazard analysis within HACCP. Okay. Um, now the strong point about this food safety bow tie is really that it's a picture. If you want to talk as a QA manager to your general manager because you want some investments on food safety and you're going you're gonna to tell him about the 10 definitions on, on HACCP, you'll, you'll be lost. You need to be able to explain your problem to your general manager within a couple of minutes. So you've got a little time. And this picture will help you very much with um, convincing the general managers that, that some things need to be done. That we maybe need to spend more money on, on uh, monitoring or more money on control measures. Or maybe more money on training. Um, so, HACCP is a very wordy thing, as you saw in the 10 definitions. This bow tie is a picture. And a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So, it's, it makes an easier conversation. Ideally, you could calculate if I invest 10,000 euros over here, what will be the result in terms of risk management. That's ideally. So, this is the bow tie approach. Um, 
yeah. And this is basically also the, the end of the first uh, presentation. Uh, in the next presentation, um, we will talk about ISO 22000 and in conjunction with uh, FSSC 22000 to see if, uh, how they relate to, uh, to this food safety bow tie and to see if we're heading in the right direction. Okay, thank you for so far.